Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's podcast is looking at anterior open bites and is covering a series of lectures from the AAO. Now this podcast is looking at the key diagnostic criteria and also the treatment options for anterior open bites with the evidence that supports them. It's a summary of a number of lectures by Robert Carrillo, Flavio Artesi and the prolific Ravi Nanda. Now just to recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself. I may not be 100% accurate to the, or representative of the original lecture, although we will try our best to ensure that it is. It is the independent work of myself and the orthodontics in summary team. Now back to the lecture. So what are the goals when it comes to managing anterior open bite cases? Well, this was said in a very succinct phrase by Kessling back in 1946, and that is to reduce time in treatment. It's only possible if the operator first determines the main goals and then coordinates all their efforts towards that end. And Robert Carrillo broke that down really quite nicely for AOB cases. We have to consider treatment for the etiology and then treatment in light of our mechanics. So when it comes to the etiology, we've got numerous causes. Now, tongue posture and thrusting or mouth breathing is one of the main topics of conversation and how this affects the zone of equilibrium and therefore this AP and vertical changes to the position of the incisors. So the first debate is about tongue posture versus tongue thrusting or swallowing. And actually it is the tongue posture which affects the position of the incisors, not the thrusting or swallowing. And that's down to the low intensity of the function of the tongue, but also the duration being quite short. Now, just because the tongue is postured forward doesn't mean the presentation is going to be the same. Actually, there are three main different presentations for forward postured tongue. The tongue can be forwards and high, resulting in proclination to the upper incisors. The tongue can just be forwards and horizontal, resulting in biomax proclination. And the tongue can be forwards and low, resulting in lower incisor proclination. And that is a key part of the etiology. Flavor RTC broke that down really quite nicely, and we've covered it previously in a podcast of a power to reason back in 2020, if you want to know more details. Now, when it comes to mouth breathing, this is a contentious issue when it comes to orthodontics. The concept is here that there is nasal restriction, so mouth breathing takes place, and there is a correlation in the evidence between constricted maxilla, anterior open bites, and nasal breathing. However, the treatment itself has not been determined. So surgical treatment such as a tonsillectomy is not something currently recommended for mouth breathers by the AAO HNS guidelines. So when it comes to looking at treatment for anterior open bite cases, it's important to note the extent of the anterior open bite does not determine the treatment modality. This was a paper back by Duplin back in 2016, and what it showed is that there's a poor correlation between a high angle and low angle case and the size of the anterior open bite. We need to look at our other skeletal parameters and not just the extent of the anterior open bite. When it comes to etiology of the tongue posture, we have habit dissuaders in the forms of cribs and spurs that can be used. Now, what we're looking at when it comes to a high tongue is to try and block the tongue coming forwards. It's different for a low tongue position. We want to redirect the tongue back upwards behind the upper central incisors. Now, Robert Carilli spoke about a removable habit dissuader for adult patients specifically. And a really neat clinical tip is to use an aligner, have some attachment in the design behind the upper central incisors and lateral incisors. Use a probe to poke through that attachment, uh, that attachment area. And that makes an uncomfortable area for patients. He said for adult patients, this is far more tolerable than a fixed type of habit dissuader. Now, when it comes to looking at how successful this is using cribs or spurs, the relapse potential is 17%. So it's reasonably high. But let's put that into context with other types of treatment. So when we start looking at dental treatments for incisor extrusion or posterior molar intrusion, relapse is much higher. 38% for incise extrusion by Janssen 2003, and molar intrusion has a relapse of 27%. That's Espinosa in 2020. When it comes to looking at surgical management, that's not much better at 25% relapse for orthognathic surgery. That's Greenlee's systematic review from 2011. And all in all, we have a significant amount of relapse for our anterior open bite cases. Now, when it comes to looking at myofunctional therapy, specifically speech and language, 
The research suggests it's much lower relapse rates, but it comes with a caveat. This 4% relapse with my functional therapy is limited to just a few papers, and it's still a very great area within research. So when it comes to posterior intrusion, whether we're using screws or mini plates, it really depends upon the anatomical limitations. Now, Robert Carrillo gave a really great tip when it came to using skeletal anchorage for posterior intrusion with aligners. And he called it the CT approach. And essentially it involves using a, an elastic that the patient uses within the aligner itself. C refers to cuts, they're placed buccally, and they're also placed on the uh, labial aspect buckle aspect and on the occlusal side. Now the premise here is it's a rigid aspect of the aligner so it's not going to buckle. It's in the premolar and in the molar region and the patient essentially preloads it before inserting the aligner. They insert the aligner in and simply flick the elastic over the buckle plate or the tad. So in conclusion there are a number of factors that result in anterior open bite cases being managed in different methods. When it comes to managing the tongue, we have to look at where is the tongue positioned in its forwards posture, but also looking at the reality of the relapse rates associated with the different modalities, whether it's ranging from habit dissuaders through to dental intrusion or extrusion, or looking at skeletal changes that take place. There's still a significant relapse for anterior open bite cases. I think being open in our consent process is an important factor in managing these patients. That brings us to the end of this Orthodontics and Summary podcast. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.